I am very pleased to be talking with a man who needs no introduction to my audience, the intrepid author, researcher, and filmmaker, L.A. Marsuli. L.A. and I have known each other for quite some time now and have had the opportunity to collaborate on several projects over the years. We will be discussing one such project today. But before we begin, I would like to remind everyone of my upcoming Birthright Conference, taking place in Nashville, Tennessee, from the 6th through the 7th of May. The conference will feature topics related to transhumanism, aliens, UFOs, and Bible prophecy. Tickets are currently 20% off. You can find a link to purchase tickets in the description of this video or on my website, timothyalberino.com. The VIP tickets are nearly sold out, and the general admission tickets are going fast, so don't delay if you want to attend. As always, I would also like to direct you to my book, Birthright, The Coming Post-Human Apocalypse and the Usurpation of Adam's Dominion on Planet Earth. Birthright continues to be a five-star bestseller on Amazon, with over 800 reviews. It covers everything from the galactic rebellion in the pre-Adamic past to the creation of mankind on planet Earth, the fall of the Watchers in the pre-flood world to the machinations of Luciferian forces in modern times, the unveiling of the alien presence to the final battle at Armageddon. Pick up a copy of Birthright on Amazon.com. L.A., thanks for having this conversation with me today. Uh, the last time that you and I were together, I believe, was in 2019. 2019, that's it, down in Peru. As my audience is very much aware, you've been doing research into the elongated skulls, specifically the elongated skulls in Paracas, Peru, for some time now. Why don't you give us a description of what you've been doing and what you've been finding and what conclusions you've drawn from the data? Well, first of all, Tim, it's always good to be here. I wish we were a little closer instead of on Zoom here, but it is what it is. And, uh, you know, COVID shut everything down for two years. So things are beginning to loosen up. And um, I will be at the Hear the Watchman Conference in Dallas, shameless plug, from the March 17th to the 20th. No masks, no mandates, no vax passports. So come on down. It's going to be a hoot. It's going to be good. And uh, I'm excited about that. First conference in two years. But, you know, you, were, you and I were down there in 2019. Um, and we went to a place that I had never been before, the reserve deep into the reserve. I mean, I was on the outskirts of the reserve, but you know, you need, not just anybody can go into the reserve. And we were with an archeologist that, that you had, um, uh, you know, hooked up with. And he, I mean, he showed us some really interesting, interesting artifacts, interesting places, which connected some dots for me. And I know connected dots for you too. In 2013, uh, someone sent me a YouTube video, and in that YouTube video was Brian Forrester. And Brian was standing in front of a display case filled with elongated skulls, and he was reaching back, taking skulls out, and I'm just going like, you've got to be, who is this guy, and how can he possibly do that? And so I reached out to him, which resulted in, in our first trip. It was Richard Shaw, of course, the director of the Watchers series. That became uh, a best-selling DVD for us. We still have it on our site, lamarzuli.net. Uh, Judd Burton, uh, um, Aaron Judkins was our first, no, Judd Burton was our first archaeologist on that trip. Rod Moorhead was an adventurer who had been studying Bigfoot and he wanted to come down because he was wondering about the elongation of the skulls because the Bigfoot that he had seen in the reports, they all have elongated skulls. And then Joe Taylor was down there to mold some of the skulls. This is one of Joe Taylor's moles. Just incredible work. Yeah, so we go down there, and, you know, it, it was like going to school for, for a week. I mean, literally, because I'm not, I'm not trained as an archaeologist. Uh, John Burton was. So we learned about things like, I'll do it on this side, the zygomatic arts right here. You know, we learned about the sagittal suture or lack of the sagittal suture. We learned, learned about the parietal plate, which is the two, it should be, the parietal plate should be here. There should be a sagittal suture going down, splitting the parietal plate. And then of course on the back, the occipital plate. So, you know, we all, we're all in school, learning all these terms, learning how they all, like the mandible, the lower jaw, and just all these different technical terms that you learn in anatomy. 
Um, and we got to handle the skulls. We were not, we didn't take any samples back for DNA, uh, at which was, that was our first trip. We went back down in 2014 and we took hair samples from the baby mummy right behind me. And we were able to unwrap it uh, that, that, on that trip also. And that's all in the film, <clears throat> uh, Final Results DNA, which, um, again, lamarzilli.net. <clears throat> so the whole idea was, there's two schools of thought here. One is that these are all the result of cranial deformation, cradle headboarding. That's what the modern day archeologists insist on. But what do they base that on? They base that on, they went to school and someone told them, this is what they all are. They've all been uh, cranial deformed because the skulls were wrapped when the child was an infant. We're not disputing that that happens. In fact, in, in the DNA film, we got Mondo Gonzalez and I, our lead archaeologist on our team, we flew up to Vancouver Island. And this woman had a skull which had been bequeathed to her from her grandfather that had been given to her, to him, by a Native American chief. So it was like a, a token of welcome of the tribe. And he gave the grandfather this elongated skull and it was passed down. So she had it. Well, once we got it, we had Rick, we had Rick Woodward. On, on a Skype call on our cell phone. And Rick said, cradle, cranial deformation, cradle headboarding. How does he know that? I'll show you. In the back of a skull, this is the, the work of Rick Woodward. He's the guy that discovered this. Nobody else did, despite, in spite of what some people will say. So Rick, we sent all the plaster casts or the epoxy cast that Joe Taylor had done. This is a, a replica, it's not the real thing. And Rick Woodward got all of these skulls, there are about four of them, and he turned them over. And the first thing he wanted to do and look at, and it's also in the DNA film, was he wanted to see the placement of the foramen magnum right here. This is the foramen magnum. Now, the, the space that you see with this nice round hole, that's all done by Joe Taylor. But, but the original in the skull, in this skull, this is the shape of the foramen magnum. First of all, the shape's all wrong. But greater than that still, the foramen magnum sits on this skull all the way to the posterior of the skull. If it's out any further, it's outside the skull. It should be sitting here. Should be sitting right here, dead center of a skull. Let me see. Yeah, there you go. Should be sitting right here. It's not. And you can, you can deform a child's head with binding and all this other stuff, but you can't move the placement of the foramen magnum. You can't do that. In a normal human being, it's in the center of a skull, just like yours, just like mine, to balance the skull. This skull is all the way to the posterior. That is genetic. And we've got, in, a, in, in uh, on the trail of a Nephilim, number six, we've got, you know, medical doctors, we've got surgeons, archaeologists, anthropologists, a, whole, a chiropractor, optometrist, a whole bevy of people. They're all experts in their field. And they look at the skull and they go, it's not human. Whatever this is, is genetic. It's some sort of a genetic aberration. So all of our DNA testing that we did, and we were the only team that really went down, we took 58 samples. There was a team that came down later through Brian Forrester that took 100 samples. They got nuclear DNA, allegedly. They made a film, and it's on Gaia. I have yet to watch it. I've got a link, a private link to it. I'll probably do it maybe tomorrow but I need to look at it, but Brian told me what it was. So our research, the mitochondrial DNA, showed a Middle Eastern uh, haplogroup. The haplogroup comes from the mitochondrial female side of the equation, and not all the skulls, but a preponderance of them showed a Middle Eastern or European connection. Well, that rewrites history. I mean, it does. But the academics and the scientific community didn't like our results, so they said, oh, it's all contaminated. Well, we took... Our protocols, Tim, I mean, they were they were stellar. They were right by the book. Mondo and I were dressed in head-to-toe lab suits. We had masks, goggles, hairnets, double, double um, sleeves, double gloves, boots, the whole deal. We had 40 suits. Every time we went down and we tested a skull, we would take the DNA, Chase Klotsky tagged and bagged it. Mondo and I would leave the room, take out... The, the clothes, spray each other down with compressed air, don a new set 
go back in and they'd bring another skull in and we would do the same thing. Our procedure for field work was next second to none. And people have commented on that. It's at the point now where, um, you know, there's not a lot of DNA labs in America. There, there are a bunch of them, but not a lot. If they hear Peruvian mummy or Marzulli, it, the door, the door just slams shut. They will not take our stuff. And of course, the scientific community, those who looked at the evidence, immediately said, "Oh well, it's just this is all contamination." Well, if it's contaminated, why didn't we get nuclear DNA? We never got nuclear DNA. But Brian's team that came down did get nuclear DNA, and that became the basis um, of of this show that's on Gaia. And when they looked at the, there's something called a gen bank. And in that is all the DNA of, of everything on the planet. They've taken years to create this. So if you're half porpoise, that DNA is going to show up. It's, you're going to see DNA of a porpoise in your DNA. Of course, I'm being silly here. But when they tested the Paraka skulls, they found nuclear DNA, unknown completely unknown there's nothing in the gen bank which which it's unknown which goes into our wheelhouse that what we are looking at these are the remnants of the nephilim and i believe because it's genetic it has nothing to do with cranial deformation here's something else you can bind the head of a child all you want you can't make the orbits 25 to 30 percent larger than a normal human being you can't make the pupillary distance instead of 65 millimeters, it's 45 millimeters. Our, our optometrist on our team, <clears throat> Dr. Jeff Duff, came on the record and stated, this is, first of all, this has got to be genetic. Second of all, because of the orbits being 25 to 30% larger and the pupillary distance much narrower than a human being, they could see in the dark in his estimation. We know that one of the Nephilim tribes is called the Horites, and Horites translates cave dwellers. We know that. And then you and I are down. This was this was absolutely, for me, was just mind-boggling. So the archaeologist on your team takes us way out to the reserve, middle of nowhere, some of the most pristine beaches you'll ever see in your life, right? But it's barren. It's desolate. No rainfall at all probably less than a quarter of an inch a year. Welcome to Paracas. And he shows us the remnants of a 3,000-year-old Paracas dwelling, which is still, for the most part, intact. And then there's this chimney, which goes down, all made out of river rock, chimney that's probably two foot by two foot. So it's not a giant. We know that. And I asked him, and I think you translated it for me. In fact, I'm positive you translated it. I said, well, did they find any vestiges of torchlight down there? He said, no. I go, well, how did they see? And he said, we don't know. We don't know how they saw. Well, going back to Dr. Jeff Duff, because of the pupillary distance and the size of the orbits, they more than likely could see in the dark. And we know that one of the, one of the tribes are the Horites. We're cave dwellers. So I'm not making this stuff up. Yeah, and... Um as, so as I as I mentioned earlier, you were down in Peru with me in, in 2019, and I was there working on a project, uh, a film project, and I invited you. and And, and Chase Kletsky was also with us, and uh, part of uh, it's a television series that I've been developing with Gary Haven, um, and part of that expedition was going into the Paracas Reserve. As you said, it's not easy to get permission to go in the Paracas Reserve, easy at all. Right. Um, but we had. Uh, we had a, a, an archaeologist with us named Jose Pinija from Peru, very well-connected guy, really great guy. And so we were able to get uh, access to the reserve and not only access into the reserve, but we were also able to deploy our state-of-the-art GPR technology. And for those who don't know, and I'm sure hard, nobody really knows because I haven't really, this is actually the first time LA that I'm talking about this stuff publicly um, because we haven't even published the, the show yet, um, right. uh, which you're in and as well as, as Chase. Um, but we have acquired, uh, Gary and I, Gary Haven and I have acquired a ground penetrating radar unit, two units that are state of the art. And, and what makes our units so unique, apart from the fact that they're 
using technology that's uh, it's I'm not going to say it's secret technology, but it's it's tech. There's only three units. The last time I checked, there's only three units in the world, and we have one of them. And uh, we and it, it it's a deep penetrating GPR unit, and uh, we have a shallow penetrating and a deep penetrating unit. And the and the and the the deeper unit can go down three. It can see 300 feet below the surface of the Earth, and at high resolution. And we can get a three dimensional. Um, we can we can get a three dimensional rendering through software of what we're looking at under the earth, three hundred feet down. That's amazing. And yeah. uh, and and you saw us uh, using that technology over there in, in the Procus Reserve. And it's again, it's 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 drone. It's it operates off of a drone platform. So in other words, we we can fly it around, and we run it on a grid. And uh, so we were able to deploy this technology all over the place in Peru, and we've made all kinds of astounding discoveries. But in, in Paracas specifically, um, um, what LA is referring to for the audience is, is the we, we discovered that the Paracas people, and this is something that's well known to the archaeologists in Peru. I didn't know. I certainly didn't know this until Jose Pinija told me. Um, we discovered that the Paracas people apparently in the middle of the desert, you know, and this is a coastal desert, as you said, but it's, it's, I don't know, LA, if I've, I can tell you that I have never in my life been in, in a more barren place. Yeah, likewise. It's than like that. the Sahara. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievably barren. Yeah, it, it's like grows. the surface of Mars, but with yeah, the ocean. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and you have these, they're almost like underground longhouses. That's you know, that's the kind of the way I think of it, like the like the Viking longhouses, but the but the so you can picture a Viking longhouse, but it's but it's built into the ground. So all you see is the roof of the longhouse, right? Like a hill sticking out of the ground. And the and and instead of being um, instead of the rafters being planks of wood, what you have in Paracas is the rafters are the the ribs of whales, the rail, their whale ribs, whale rib bones. And so it's like you have the, you have the spinal cord of, of the whale, and then you have the rib bones and that's the, 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 their roof basically, but the house is submerged. So, um, so it's an underground dwelling. And, and I remember you and I and Chase and the rest of our team were just, especially you and I were standing there just thinking, wait a minute, underground dwellings, and big orbital sockets on the on the on the elongated skulls, you know they're, 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 these people they like to live under the ground, and that really I know it, you know a light bulb went off in my head and I thought wait a minute this there's something even more bizarre about these people than than we originally thought. You know to see one of these guys it, it's funny um, it's not funny it, it's. <sighs> We've got a line, once again, through Brian, uh, of there's a private museum with a, a, a full mummy, elongated skull, and the skull is massive. And I've seen it. I've been up close. I've seen this. And Brian's work, trying to work something out. And what I told him, I said, well, we would go down with an x-ray machine, for starters, and x-ray this thing to see, first of all, um, does it have a longer neck? So like a giraffe has the same amount of vertebrae in its neck as we do. But what, what happens is, and I didn't know that, you know, thank you, Malcolm Warren, who's our chiropractor on our team. And he's there because he studies the skeletal anatomy, obviously. And so, you know, he told me that, that a giraffe has exactly the same number of, of bones in its neck as we do. So the difference is the giraffe's cartilage is really big. So, so, and, and, creates a big space between the joints getting an x-ray machine down there because one of our many many of the me our medical team because of the placement of the foramen magnum we now believe that there was a compensatory spinal column hmm. would be longer in other words are we looking at on a one of the nephilim tribes translates long necks that's what it translates it's not necessarily a giant. And this is what, you know, when I remember when I got into this, I used to think that, well, all the Nephilim must be giants. Not true. Because there seems to be, and this is conjecture on my part, there seems to be when we read the biblical narrative, there are different tribes in different areas. They may have different genetic characteristics, which is why their name, cave dweller, Horites, Anakim, Longnecks, 
right? The the zanzumim, the buzzing ones. So there seems to be different genetic characteristics. In other words, the dragon is still mixing the seed, desperately trying to get something that passes as human. That's conjecture, but that's what I think he's doing. He's trying to create man in his image. And you know, if I can hop on, off here just for a second, fast forward thousands of years to the present day, he's done that. There are hybrids walking amongst us, the title of Dr. Jacobs' book. There are hybrids who interact with us, and they show themselves, Al Matthews, and uh, in, in our film, our free UFO film, UFO Disclosure of the Coming Great Deception and the Luciferian Endgame. Their seed will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not cleave to them. Book of Daniel, sealed up until the end times. Seal up this book, Daniel, until, until men grow, start to go to and fro over the face of the earth, and knowledge will increase. And then that book is open. Now it's open. I remember the first time Chuck Messer expounded on that, on that sentence in Daniel. Their seed will mingle with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to them. Well, if it's not the seed of men mingling, who's mingling? Who's, it's got to be an outside force. It's not extraterrestrials. It is the seed of the dragon, Genesis 3.15, which sets up the rest of the biblical narrative. If we don't get Genesis 3.15 right, we don't get the rest of it right. And 3.15 tells us that your seed, the seed of a dragon, your offspring, the, seed, the offspring of a dragon, will be at war or enmity with the offspring of the woman. He, the pro-evangelium, Messiah, will come from the woman's seed and crush the dragon's head. That's, that's the whole book. That's the whole book. The, the entire Bible is based on that one sentence, in my opinion. Everything else is, is a sidebar. I agree. That's definitely the through narrative. It's, it's, the, uh, it's the conflict. That is the conflict from page conflict. Fr- from from chapter from from chapter one all the way through the end of the end of the book. Amen. I mean that's what it is. So you know we were able to get DNA. We look at these things. In my opinion, uh, the Paracas skulls are Nephilim, just like what happened in the Americas. Except in the Americas, we get the giants here. We get the ten and twelve footers, and we had we know and and I know you know this. There were certain Wakaros that talk about seeing the skeleton, but this is 30 years ago, of 10 and 12 footers. We also know Mm -hmm. that in the Gold Museum in in, in Lima, there were seated on thrones, two skeletons, a king and a queen, and they've disappeared and no one knows what happened. Well, we all know what happened. That's right. And if I I recall, they were of unusual size. Now they weren't like enormous, but they were like NBA basketball players. At least. Yeah. And I've heard conflicting reports. I heard 10 to 12 feet. Other people said they were, you know, seven or eight feet. That's what I've heard. Seven to eight. That's what I've heard. I heard they were they were un let's put it this way. They were uncomfortably large (laughs) for the curators. Yeah, and they don't want that. No, because the Inca, the Inca, uh, although the Inca were taller than the other native tribes. They were certainly not, you know, like Shaquille O'Neal. So, yeah, that was a, that was a, an out-of-place artifact that they disappeared. And that's, that's no conspiracy. That's, it's well-documented that those... That's what they do, and they that, do it over and over and over yeah, again. Yeah, especially in Peru. And in Peru, people need to understand, um, for those who don't know, I lived in Peru for a decade. Um, so I'm very well acquainted with how things go in Peru. And in Peru... Um, it's not even just let's hide things that point to the reality, the existence of giants or or aliens or something else. It's let's hide anything that doesn't conform to the to the accepted conventional narrative yeah. of the Incan Empire. Everything, and as you know, LA having traveled uh, uh, in Peru, all over Peru, everything has to be Inca, Inca, Inca. And uh, or pre-Inca in certain contexts, but the main stuff, all the main stuff, has to be Inca, Inca, Inca. And if something is is suggestive of 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 um, not falling in line with that narrative, then it becomes problematic, and uh, and they tend to disappear things, even just because of that. Let alone having to deal with giants or 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 DNA that's that's non-human. There's no doubt that some, something, it doesn't jive with the historical record. The historical narrative is that everyone came over here. They're all, you know, Amerindians. They all came over the Bering Strait. No one came by, by there were no seafarers. No one, no one came from Europe. You know, pre-Columbian, never existed. 
End of story. The haplogroups are all B. It's Amerindians. It comes from Asia across the land bridge at the end of the Ice Age. Yeah. What we discovered over and over and over again, one of the skulls showed a Druze haplogroup. That's really rare. Druze is in the Middle East. It's like right around the Levant area. I mean, to get a Druze reading like that, some from the Black Sea, from some from Eastern Europe, um, U2E1, from this one right here, the baby skull, if I can get that. So this is what we affectionately call the baby skull. This is a 1,935-year skull. Again, look at the orbits, 25 to 35% Huge. large. Yeah, look look at the elongated skull. This thing's about two years old. Look, look at the massive frontal plate. Look at that. Look at this thing. And guess what? Guess where the foramen magnum is, folks? All the way in the back. You can see the little hole that, that we had to work with. All It should be here. It should be like right in the center. It's not. It's all the way to the back. So this is not cranial deformation. It had reddish hair. And um, this showed, we did this three different labs, two different times, U2E1. So, and I'll tell you, I mean, I, I don't care anymore because they're just, UCLA, you know, when I asked, well, we've got more samples, I got this nasty letter back from the head geneticist. But when we went down there, this guy was all into it. He was like excited by it. So we actually got um, a reading and it was U2E1. Then University of Santa Cruz, which I'm not supposed to say, but I don't care. I'll say it now. <laughs> they got U2E1. And then, of course, the Haplo group up in Canada who love us and they will do our testing. And maybe now they've got better machines that might be able to extract nuclear. Who knows? Because that was years ago. And that was U2E1. So we have three different labs looking at this, all coming up with the same haplogroup, group, U2E1. It's Eastern Europe. I'm not making this stuff up. Jim. Now, doesn't that coincide with the results that uh, Brian Forster was also uh, received yeah, after conducting his DNA yeah. analysis? Yeah, Eastern Europe, Black Sea. Black Sea Europe. region, that, yeah. That whole, that whole area. And we anyway. should and we should say that uh, you know elongated skulls obviously are not exclusive to Peru, although the Paracas elongated skulls uh, are, I think, um, are the most impressive that I've ever seen. Are the most bizarre, let's say. At, well, at the very let, me, let me show you one thing here. This was taken. This is from my book. This was taken out on Catalina Island. I discovered the photograph, and you know the way the world works. Everybody steals your stuff. And never gives you credit. It's just the way it works. This is a picture that I discovered out on Catalina Island years ago. There was a lost cache of records that had gone missing from this primitive archaeologist by the name of Ralph Good. Well, I found a nine-footer, which is right behind me. But this is, you tell me where this is. And look at the baby. Catalina Island. They were here. And that's what people don't get. They were all over the Americas. They were here. The giants were here. In fact, you know, I'm, I'm shameless plug, but I'm doing a show on the PTL network on the trail of a Nephilim. And we're talking about the Ralph Glidden skeleton. That's the second show. The first show was the primer. You need to watch the first show. It'll air on the 11th on Friday, Friday night, um, 11 o'clock Eastern Standard, 8 o'clock um, Pacific. And then, of course, it airs, I think, all throughout the week. So we're really excited about this. Um, and I'm working on show number two, show number three. I'm, Tim, I've got so much material. It's just ridiculous. So it's and airing it's, this this coming Friday. Your first show is airing coming this coming Friday on, on coming the PTL Friday. Network. PTL Network, yeah. Well, obviously, I encourage everybody to go watch that. I think that's going to be fun. I'm a trail of an Nephilim. Yeah, pretty cool. Now, what do you think about what do you think about uh, because, as I said, the, the elongated skulls obviously are not uh, are not exclusive to Peru. You have the ones there from Catalina Island, um, sure. and uh, and the, the, this Black Sea origin I find very intriguing. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, look, they were they were they migrated. They they, they were everywhere when when Joshua and Caleb came in um, into the Levant after Jericho. That's when you know, it's it, everybody, the Nephilim realized that, wait a minute, this isn't fair. This just isn't Joshua and Caleb coming in. 
because they didn't do squat for Jericho. They just walked around the thing seven times and blew the shofar. The walls came down. And, you know, it's people go, that's genocide, like Richard Dawkins. And they killed everybody. That's genocidal. No, they were hybrids. We don't know what they look like, but they weren't supposed to be there. They were all contaminated. They all had Nephilim blood. That's why the mandate comes down. That's why, unless we understand the seed war, when you get to the conquest of Canaan, you go, oh, my God, God's a genocidal maniac. That's what it seems like, but he's not. They're, they're Nephilim tribes that are in the Levant. So where was I going with this? Um, oh, Talking about the Black, the Black Sea. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a stele. All right. There was this massive migration right after that conquest. Massive migration. They fled. They went into Sardinia, as you know, and they camped out there for quite some time. They went to Malta. They went to, to Gozo. They went to um, basically, and then up into Europe, Menga, Menga, uh, Spain. We were there. We filmed in the largest dolmen on the freaking planet. The thing is humongous. I've never done anything with the film. I can't get to it because I'm so backlogged with stuff. But we were there and we filmed in inside. There was nobody there that day. It's a park. It's got gates all around the thing. And there was one security guard. But because the guy that we were with knows everybody, they opened up the whole place. I flew the drone. There was no one there. We had it all to ourselves. It was just, it was a God thing. There's a stele on Northern, uh, Northern Africa, which says this. We are they who fled from Joshua, the robber, the son of Nun. We are they who fled from Joshua, the robber, the son of Nun. Mondo Gonzalez told me this. And I mean, that's, that, is absolutely unbelievable. Yeah, I I, uh, I found that when I was I also I also came across that uh, um, that inscription when I was uh, doing when I was doing research for the film one of the True Legends films, um, and that was in the region of what is today I believe it was in what was Algeria. that's right but what was in the ancient uh, city of Tingis I think it was called if I if I recall. The Phoenicians, yeah. Yeah, and it was it was a Phoenician settlement. It was a Phoenician settlement. And so it was, in fact, the Phoenicians who erected that pillar. And it was inscribed on the pillar. So we are those who fled. We are those who fled from the face of Joshua the robber, the son of Nun. And and and, and that implies that the Phoenicians Obviously, the Phoenicians, the origin of the Phoenicians was in Canaan. We know that. Canaanites. Um, they're they're, they, they're Canaanites. The Phoenicians yeah. were Canaanites. It was the Greeks who called them Phoenicians. And the Phoenicians, of course, the most famous uh, Phoenician incident in history was Hannibal, because the Carthaginians were Phoenicians. Um, and by the way, this kind of gets us down a little interesting path here, but it, um, it's a little bit of a digression. But But the Phoenicians were... The Phoenicians were a secret society, and, and, and it's my contention that, that you cannot truly understand or appreciate ancient history if you don't understand the Phoenicians, because the Phoenicians are everywhere. They're involved in everything all the time. Obviously, the Phoenicians show up in the Bible a lot in, in Tyre and Sidon, sure. which are very, very important cities in the biblical narrative and which were adversaries to Israel, and adversaries to Israel, but then also at times friends. Um, it was uh, the king of Tyre was uh, a friend of Solomon and, and helped him build a temple. And uh, that's where you get the, 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 uh, the legend of, uh, of uh, Hiram Abiff and so forth. That comes from the Phoenicians. In fact, much I, I would say that the origin of masonry it also... Uh, begins with the with the Phoenicians, um, but that's a whole other conversation. But the Phoenicians were a trade empire, and they never they never went very far inland because their power was in the sea. They were the masters of the sea. So there were two things that the Phoenicians excelled at. In fact, I would say there are three things that the Phoenicians excelled at. Um, they excelled at navigating the seas. They were the great navigators of the ancient world, and they did 
cross the Atlantic, as you know well, as you well know. They were the great yeah. navigators of the world. Indeed, the, they were the milit they were the the navy of the Egyptians in many cases. The Egyptians, all their boats and their and, and all of that came from the Phoenicians. In fact, all the cedar, the cedars of Lebanon that were used in the great palaces in the ancient world, from Greece down to down to Egypt were, were the cedars of Lebanon. They were the cedars of the Phoenicians that the Phoenicians were harvesting and, and building their boats. And by the way, as an aside, and I'll get back to the other two things that the Phoenicians are known for, most famously, as an aside, the Phoenicians built their, built their boats in such a way with the, with, the, with the cedars. They were made out of cedar planks. They built their boats in such a way that they were modular. They could disassemble their boats carry the planks across the land and quickly reassemble them to navigate the rivers in the interior of continents. They were mind-blowingly sophisticated when it, came to, um, when it came to seafaring and navigation. The second thing that the Phoenicians are known for is their masonry, surpassing masonry. The Phoenicians were undoubtedly the great masons of the ancient world. Who laid the megalithic foundations of, of Jerusalem? The Phoenicians did. It's in the Bible. The account is right there. They brought in the artisans. They brought in the stone workers. It was the Phoenicians who did it. And I would, I, I would argue that when we, see, when we see megalithic constructions in a post-flood context, as, especially on the island of Sardinia, I attribute it to the Phoenicians. I think they're the only ones who retained the knowledge to build megaliths in a po but uh, to build megaliths in a post flood context, context, albeit albeit to a much lesser degree, it, it, they were is still inferior to those who had preceded them in the pre flood world. But they they were they somehow were able to keep some of that knowledge to to safeguard some of that knowledge. And then of course the third thing that the Phoenicians are known for is they excelled in writing. You know, we get our alphabet from the Phoenicians. That's why, you know, that's why we call it phonetics. It comes from the Phoenicians. And so combine those three things together. These guys are the greatest seafarers of the ancient world. They're the greatest masons and they're, and they're the writers. They're, they're, the, they, they're the, the record keepers and the writers and the, and, um, and the masters of language, let's say. When you combine those three things together... That is a remarkable civilization that is weaving its way through some of the most important stories in the in antiquity, as I said, including the uh, the Carthaginian um, wars with uh, you know Hannibal and the Romans, um, and then also, you know, you talk about the the, the Nephilim, um, the, the diaspora of the Nephilim all over the earth. How did they get to America? So how do you have giants in the land of Canaan that are fleeing from the face of Joshua, the son of Nun? How are they ending up in North America? Because as you well know, and by the way, LA's done great work on this, and I, and I commend everybody to LA's work on this, the, the mound builders in America. Without question, there were the, the bones of giants were discovered in the mounds of America. Even Abraham Lincoln references That's it. That's about it, right? I mean, there were giant bones in the mounds of America, full stop, end of story. There is a mountain of evidence that uh, there were giant bones in, in, discovered in, in America, including what LA has on the wall there behind him from the Catalina Islands. Um, so how did those giants get here? I contend that they came through the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians had a cult of giant worship. There's a stone, and this is in our Amitrail of Nephilim, episode four and five. We went, we spent a lot of time in America Stonehenge. We were there with Fritz Zimmerman. Dennis Stone is the curator, the owner of the property. So on, a, on my first foyer there, uh, Fritz was not with me. So it's just, I'm following Den, uh, Dennis's son, um, Kelsey, and I've got one of those little Osmo things. And we're just going through the museum, B-roll. That's with B-roll, right? And he's showing me, obviously, the arrowheads, but these are the, you know, 28-pound axe heads that shouldn't be there, but they are. This is the 28-day column that was, and he's just, you know, walking me through the museum. And so I'm, I'm filming him. It's all B-roll. And then he gets to this one case. He gets to this one case. And I go, well, what's this? Well, these are the stones that had writing on them. Oh, really? Well, what's this one say? And he goes, well, this, and where was it found? He goes, well, this was found in a collapsed chamber under about a foot of soil. 
and we uncovered it and we realized it was writing, but we couldn't, had no idea what it was looking at, okay? So it lay in the museum for 11 years. And then enter Professor Barry Fell from Harvard University, who looked at the stone and said, I think I can translate it. That looks like Iberian Punic. And so I said, well, Kelsey, what does it say? And Kelsey goes, it says this, to Baal of the Canaanites in dedication. And in the film, when I left it, you hear this long pause, and I'm, I'm just like, I can't even believe what I just heard. And I go, what did you just say? And Kelsey kind of laughs nervously. To Baal of the Canaanites in dedication. And, and we kept on filming. When we were done, I said, you have no idea what you just did. And we took the, the stone out of the case, laid it on the table, and there was a roundtable discussion. And I educated them in all things Nephilim and what this is. The Nephilim are here. Absolutely. And it's and like uh, and uh, the, the Iberian Punic, that is Carthaginian territory. That's why the Romans called it the Punic Wars. That's what they called the, uh, that's how they referred to the, uh, to the Phoenicians. So that's why today we refer to that as the Punic Wars. So that's Phoenician. Yeah, all day long. Yeah, and so. And, Tim, that's so, a 4,000 year old site. That's a 4,000 year old site with a huge sacrificial table on it. And if you, you know, if you sail due west, if you sail due west from Canaan, you go through the Eastern Mediterranean, through the Western Mediterranean, through the Straits of Gibraltar, straight across, I mean, beeline straight across from the Straits of Gibraltar, you end up in America. In, you end up in the, uh, the bay. What's that bay called up there uh, that, could, that once connected to the Great Lakes? I forget the name of that bay up there on the map up in Canada. But um, the Phoenicians just due west from the Straits of Gibraltar. You are in North America, and you're in the great, the let's say the Great Lakes system. That's where you end up. So the Phoenicians could have sailed straight over the over the Atlantic, which they did. No question. I mean, the Phoenicians. It's a matter of history that the Phoenicians uh, circumvented uh, Africa. They circumvented Africa. I mean, these guys were said there was pr pretty much maybe maybe outside of Antarctica, there was pretty much nowhere that they couldn't get to. The Phoenicians were up in Scotland. The and, Phoenicians and, and four thousand years ago, they may have gone to Antarctica. That's very possible. That's very the, and that and that's, the recent map where it shows exactly. The How does exactly. that exactly was it the Phoenician are the Phoenicians responsible for some of those old maps? It's very possible. You know, but in know, my mind, there's no question that the Phoenicians came to North America. And they oh, and they came none. through they came through the Great Lakes system. And yeah, remember, they could yeah. disassemble their they could disassemble their boats. They were modular, they could dis like Legos, right? They could disassemble <laughs> their boats and reassemble them on land and then navigate the rivers. They were in the Great Lakes and they were mining copper in the Great Lakes. All day long. In fact, the copper in the All Great the, the Michigan copper has a trademark purity. It's got a trademark purity. Um, and I and I forget what it is, 99 point something, 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 right? It, but it's trademark. In other words, when you find a purity of that degree in copper, it likely came from the Michigan copper mines. You know where it came from, sure. Well, it's guess where they found that? Well, guess, guess where they find, found that copper? At least. Sardinia. There you go. Sardinia. Surprise. And as you know, LA, because you were uh, in Sardinia as well, uh, Sardinia was a hub Oh, of the Canaanites oh, and, the, and the Phoenicians, yeah. In a way that, I mean, I think it was. I think it was, as I say in the film that I made about. It, I think it was ground zero for the for the Canaanites. I think that that's the primary. That was their fallback position when they were driven out of Canaan. They went to Sardinia and they fortified Sardinia. Big time. And Sardinia is kind of a whole other topic, but you know, on, on Sardinia, you have to this day, you have these uh, megalithic sepulchers that are called the tombs of the giants and have been called the tombs of the giants since time immemorial. And if you go online and you type in tombs of giants Sardinia, you're going to find some armchair archaeologists who say, Giants couldn't even fit into those tombs. It's you know that it has nothing to do with giants. It's just folklore. Well, that's that's ridiculous. As you well know, you could easily fit 
a body of a giant, even in the smallest of the tombs of the giants on the island of Sardinia. I know because I laid down in them. Exactly. And you could easily fit a, an 8 to 12 to 15 foot guy in even the smallest of the tombs of the giants. Well, it, it's just like Gilgal Raphaim and, 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 and the tomb of the giants on Sardinia. But what I found interesting about the tomb of the giants in Sardinia was there was a comparison between what I saw there because of this little niche off to the side in the tomb where someone would lay down. The giant is probably still there intact in, in, you know, in situ, probably 10 feet down, 12 feet down underneath that. And in America Stonehenge, the Oracle Chamber, it's almost exactly the same. When you walk into the Oracle Chamber, Oracle Chamber there to your left is a little, a little place, a little alcove where an initiate could come in and they would basically transfer the energy from that giant, the spirit of that giant, that Nephilim giant, into the acolyte, into the into the neophyte. One more thing. Thor Heyerdahl proved that you could go from North Africa, straight to Gibraltar, essentially, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. No map, no nothing. Have a sail, and the trade winds would blow you to the island of Barbados without even knowing anything about anything. The trade winds will just blow you to Barbados. But the Phoenicians were expert sailors. They knew longitude That's right. and latitude. And you're right. They were all over the East Coast, America, Stonehenge, inland in New Hampshire. And they were there for they were there four thousand years ago. And the and the and the and the area of the United States that I was referencing early, if you if you sail through the Straits of Gibraltar and you sail due west. You will end up in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, which is, which is the Lawrence access River, way. That's it. That's, that's the, the access, access way into the Great Lakes. Yeah. And again, one of the contentions that people would have is, yeah, but how do they get past Niagara Falls? How do they get past these these impediments? They disassemble their boats and they put them back together in the river. The, I mean, go. this is what the Phoenicians were famous for. And uh, and a point I wanted to make about Sardinia, I I, I hadn't. I hadn't, you, you, I had never heard you say that um, about what you discovered in terms of the the acolyte in that site here in America, America Stonehenge, that uh, that it it corresponds perfectly. They're almost identical. Tim. It corresponds almost perfectly identical. to what I discovered in Sardinia, because in Sardinia, in the tombs of the giants, you have a like a large. Usually, you have like a large face stone. And by the way, those tombs. And um, for those who don't know, and I'll, I'll probably throw an image up here as we're talking about it, but the tombs are shaped, they're in the shape of a bullhead. Right. And some people say it's a boat, you know, it looks like a boat, but I think it's a bullhead. They're in the shape of a bullhead, so like a, the, the, with the horns and the face of a bull, and uh, they're megalithic stones, and the stones are cyclopean. In other it's words, huge. there's no mortar. They're just large stones that are configured... Um, without the use of mortar, in the shape of a bullhead. And some of the stones are very large. Uh, but what a lot of people don't realize is that they were covered with a mound. They were covered with earth. So in the ancient times, you would not see the megalithic stones. You would see a mound. You would see an earthen mound covering the stones. And all you would see is that curved entrance. So the bullhorn sort of curved towards you. And in the middle of that curve is a, is a face stone. That's sort of blocking the entrance to the tomb. But in the stone at the bottom, near the bottom of the stone, is an opening. There's an opening, a little doorway in the front of the stone. And it's been, it's suggested by archaeologists that that doorway is so that the soul of the people buried could escape or whatever, blah, blah, blah. No, in fact, in fact, that doorway is related to a Phoenician rite. It's called the rite of incubation. There you go. And so the and the doorway is small so that only a child could go through it or an adolescent. So an adolescent or a child, when they came of age, who knows, probably in those times, maybe 14 years old, who knows, 13, 14 years old. I don't know what it was back in those times. When they came of age, they would they would crawl into the tomb through the small doorway and they would literally incubate in the tomb for who knows how long. And the design of the tomb was exactly what you just said, was so that they could commune. Right. They could commune with the hero buried beneath. That's, right. That's exactly what and it if is. You, and if you, and if you, um, 
if you familiarize yourself with the with the with the mythology and the legends in Sardinia, that hero who was buried beneath happened to be a giant. And that's why the tombs are called the tombs of the giants. So that that corridor that's in the middle of the tomb, that chamber, it's not supposed to house a body, a dead body. Right. It's supposed to be a chamber into which these young people would go for the incubation rite. And they would sit in there. And that's why in the tombs in, in, uh, of the giants in Sardinia, you see a little area where, where that's sort of a little niche where you can sit on a bench yeah. and maybe put a candle there. And the whole idea was to absorb the, the power, the prowess of the Giborim buried beneath, of the mighty one yep. buried beneath, and to commune with the heroes of old. And, uh, and that was the point of the tombs. And it's amazing to me that if you, that if you go to Sardinia, uh, the people, the natives in Sardinia, they know this. They know this. They know this legend, this tradition. Um, but if you talk to some of the archaeologists, there's, there's, there was, to this day, they will tell you that, oh, no, the tombs, the chambers inside of the tombs were large because it was fam familial burials, right? So you would get a whole family buried inside. And the little doorway was for the spirits to escape up into the, up into the cosmos make, or whatever. What drives me nuts about these guys, they just make it up as they go along. They yeah. really do. They Be just make it up. Because they don't before. consult with the tradition of the people. They never do. They never ask the Native Americans here or the, or the people on Sardinia. Well, they're just peasants. They don't know. Exactly. And by they, the way, the, 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 the people in Sardinia, they did a genetic test some years ago. It wasn't that long ago. They tested the, the genetics of the Sardinian people. And do you know what they came up with? Yeah, Middle East. Phoenician. Phoenician, of course. I was gonna they say are Phoenician. And yeah. guess what you see on Sardinia? A whole lot of red hair. In fact, our, our mutual friend, Paula, uh, uh, who's a tour gu guide in, uh, in, in Sardinia, has red hair. And she will tell you that I'm Phoenician. The Sardinians are Phoenician. And these rites and the tombs and everything, it's all related to Phoenician rites. And of course, they have the, uh, uh, they have the, uh, the Nuragi civilization. Yeah, that's uh, a whole different number. Yeah. That's famous on the island. But, but the Nuragi yeah. civilization... A lot of the, the locals believe that the Nuragi civilization was an offshoot of the Phoenician civilization. I, I would I would concur with that. That's what I think too. Which is I itself an offshoot of the Canaanites. I've got a, I've got another interview coming up in one minute. So, well, this was great, LA, and uh, we'll, not, I know we could talk all night. We're, we're, we're gonna have to uh, we're gonna have to jump back on again before long, and uh, we've got a whole lot more to talk about. But we'll Absolutely we'll we'll can. shut it down right here. All right. Hey, God thanks for coming on. And everybody, go buy L.A.'s books. Go get his films. <laughs> go over to his website. His stuff is awesome. Thanks, Timmy. We'll see you soon. Have a great vacation. Thanks, L.A. Bye.